And so I think all of this contributes to the silencing of a woman, especially in terms of emotional abuse. So what do we do about it, Jim? And I loved when we were processing this, you said, first of all, we don't want to take our response to an extreme. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to take like, okay, we've gotten to the place where we don't want to be silenced about the emotional abuse we're experiencing. But you made a great point. We don't want to immediately go from being absolutely quiet about it to suddenly swinging the pendulum in the other yeah. direction and taking <clears throat> our our voicing of it to such an extreme. Well, we can be. Lord knows I can be a creature of extremes. So I will have no voice or I will have co-signed, literally co-signed someone's unhealthy treatment of me. I read a book, a podcast, podcasts like this one, and I get some insight, which is good insight. And I take this beach ball that I proverbially I've held underwater and you know I have this in my office. I have a beach ball and I have a hand grenade. It's been gutted, but it's a real hand grenade, right? And I hold it underwater. And finally, I begin to go, yeah, I need to say something here. And I come out like a grenade and I do things and I have this massive vulnerability hangover later, which means I just went out and said all the stuff and I'm like, I should have not, I was not emotionally self-regulated mm -hmm. during that time. I understand that. So the idea of being able to slowly be able to find a safe person and begin at 30,000 feet and say, I'd like to tell you, here's what I'm experiencing it versus coming out, moving from, you know, being, you know, quiet like a mouse and then getting a megaphone. I understand why that's that danger. It goes quick when I finally found my voice and I got to proclaim it from the rooftops. You'll regret that, especially if you're doing that in such a way that you have a bit of vengeance. I've seen that. I mean, just, I, I want to get somebody. Mm -hmm. You're going to regret that later if you have integrity, I think. Mm. And so... Besides just the knowledge of, okay, we want to find our voice, mm -hmm. but we don't want to go from mouse to megaphone. Right. So what is, what is that middle ground look like? So I, what I literally experience do with people, if I have a chance to, to work with them, uh, is to have them come in and say, I would like to listen. So I know I'm a safe person as a licensed professional counselor and licensed clinical mental health counselor, I am bound by confidentiality and they know it. So say, let me hear your story. I, to use my words in the vernacular, I don't egg them on. Yeah, come on. Wow. Woo. I need to stay. I mean, act adult, but like a professional, right? At level one level and say, but the three words I use is tell me more. Mm. So I'm trying to slowly invite them to put out their data on the table. And you know, because we've talked so much about fact and impact, I'll say, okay, let's stop for a moment. Here's the fact, this is what happened to you. Let's talk for a moment, what's the impact? So I'm already slowing them down, trying to. What do you think that did to you? Remember the same sun that hardens clay, softens butter. What do you think that did to you? And then I'll say, let's just take a thought, just a thought gently and go, where might you be in your family of origin story? Naming, not blaming. Where are you? Mm. We said if it's hysterical, often it could be historical. Where did this ever happen to you before? I believe right there, and we talked about this in the last podcast, Jesus, the woman at the well. He's deep into the narrative. I mean, he could have said, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, you're sleeping with dudes. You're he finally says, and I just feel him lean back and say, tell me about your husband. Now, that's a wise counselor. That's a wise friend that doesn't just go for the juggler right away. Mm -hmm. So I try to draw them out, and I'm trying to invite them to emotional self-regulation that they literally, in this amygdala part of their brain, where trauma is, can slow themselves down, regulate, and say, yeah, this is what happens, and I use then my hub. It's not a technique. It's true. H-U-B, I hear you, ma'am, and I understand you. Mm or I'm trying to understand you, and B is I believe you and I believe in you. Because most people just not believe. They're going to think, whoa, boy. But I'm working, and you as a good friend, watching, tuning in, listening today, can help your friends as iron sharpens iron. You can help them uh, regulate, and let's just remember the word of God in Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, turns away anger, double hermeneutic. As I get gentle with you, it's going to lower my anger. Whoa! I'm going to it's soften, and it will help you soften. But harsh words, come on, you ought to get him. I can't believe he did that. My harsh words stir up my anger and will stir up yours. That is one of the most powerful applicable verses for talking about emotional 
and spiritual abuse. Mm -hmm. I like what you said there, Jim, about fact and impact, because sometimes the facts get a little confusing. Well, does that qualify as emotional abuse? Does this qualify as emotional abuse? You know, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. And so I think with the fact, we have to look at the spectrum of severity and the spectrum of occurrence. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's important. But I think a bigger thing that I think gets left out of the conversation is the impact. I think it's easier to identify emotional abuse when you consider the impact that it has had on the person experiencing the fact. And we're back to the bruised hand that we can see Mm -hmm. the coloration and Joel's excellent point that he elaborated on. That is the impact where it gets harder to say, what is the impact to my soul? I think it just takes some time. Proverbs 20, verse 5, the purposes in all of our hearts are deep water, so we must go down deep to draw them out. It's harder to see that emotional and spiritual impact. Joel, I want to get to you, but um, before we do, Jim, there were three Gs that I found really helpful Mm -hmm. when you were talking about, okay, we don't want to be like a mouse, but we don't want to swing it over to a megaphone, Mm -hmm. and that was grovel, grandstand, and then grounded is in the Mm -hmm. middle. So do you want to just touch on those three Gs? Pretty simple. I just sat with someone one day a number of years ago, and I said, you know, you don't want to do this. Thank you, seriously, Holy Spirit, for being my teacher. The (laughs) Holy Spirit gave it to me. And I said, you're in a relationship, you don't want to grovel. That's just begging and walking on eggshells. If you walk on eggshells, the relationship in integrity is over for the moment. Mm -hmm. Real integrity in a relationship cannot happen. Real connection, if somebody's walking on eggshells, don't grovel, please, is there any way? Would you just hear me? Even the voice box tightens. The other extreme is, well, fine, I won't grovel. I'm going to grandstand. And I had a person once, no kidding, say to me, I finally got your point. I stopped walking on eggshells and I started, said it word for word, I am stomping on eggshells all over my spouse. He kind of missed the point. Don't grovel, please beg, don't grandstand. I'll just get big, and here's my line in the sand. I dare you to cross it. I see people do that. And start throwing emotional abuse back. Uh, Right there, quid pro quo, Clarice. It's like bam, bam, bam. And then to be grounded. And that is to be that healthy adult self. You want to love well, 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I doggone it, I acted like a child, thought, reasoned, I love that, reasoned, I rationalized like a child, but when I became an adult, no therapist, no Bible teacher, no theologian, for a moment, I put away childish things. I put away, so that piece is to be grounded, is to say, is somebody going to come at me and that I just react, or do I want to learn, take a breath, lean back, and respond not react. It will change over time. You say, man, I feel like I'm, I feel more like an adult. I'm responding. They came in and pressed buttons. So you don't have to show up to every drama you're invited to. You just no. don't. You got popcorn and a Coke and say, I might show up to this one. No, no. Mm, I think that's so good. And I think part of staying grounded is to realize you're empowered to call out hurt without expressing and creating more hurt. Mm, Well stated. And so we don't want to grovel, beg that person to change when they may be unwilling or incapable of changing, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't want to grandstand, throw abuse back at that person. Mm -hmm. We want to be grounded in the middle, find our voice appropriately, and get help. Because ultimately, we want the emotional abuse to end. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you see that, by the way, under the... Third G, be grounded. Do you just see what's right below it? That fourth G snuck in on us, and you yes, know what I it did. is. Grief. We talked about that. We've talked about it in our webinars. We've been, you and I have been doing with Joel, is the grief to have ba- all good, healthy boundaries and self-care require grief. What do you mean? Is But if I have this boundary, this person may talk about me, they may blast me on social media, stop liking my post, or they may divorce me or leave me. And so the idea of staying in that grounded place usually... I think will require grief. You may not see it coming yet, but the idea, it will cost you something to stay grounded. Mm -hmm. always does. Yeah, and to connect these things theologically, I remember when you were talking about this for the first time, Jim, some lights were gone off in my mind of thinking of these responses with our identity as Mm -hmm. image bearers of God. Mm -hmm. So here's what happens. When you grovel, what you're doing is you're participating in being subhuman. We're actually so denying good. the image of God. And so a woman who who goes into a position of silence or grovel, whatever it might be, it is actually denying your image that you rightly bear in, uh, in God. Grandstanding 
is now the opposite. It is being superior or akin to being like God. So if groveling is being subpar, sub-image, then grandstanding is actually elevating yourself above the image that was given to you, that was Mm -hmm. granted to you. It's a position of superiority. So being grounded is actually rightly living out the reality of being in the likeness and image of God. And so then I'm going to connect the fourth one. Well, how do you do this? Grief. That's what you just described. Grief is the counterbalance. It's the protection for us um, to keep us from falling too deep into groveling or elevating too high into grandstanding. And grief taps into humility and humility is what grounds us. And mm. I think that's so important. And I just want to just from another standpoint, when we hear silence, I want us to be careful that we don't equate silence with um, like a one dimensional not talking Right, because as actually, in wisdom, <laughs> to, no, I don't know if that's what you mean. Like, there's a place to not talk. Yeah, so there's a place of meditation. So yeah, and we'll get to that. But I'm also thinking about the Garden of Eden when the temptation, the first temptation, takes place with the serpent. Oh. The serpent is so deceitful because the serpent doesn't just squash uh, the conversation. Right, the serpent actually reframes, realters. It, it brings in theological dishonesty and. And what what happens is a silencing through suppression. So the woman is able to speak. The irony is that Adam's the one who's silent the whole time, right? That's the greatest irony of this entire thing. But there's a suppression. And so if you're in a position of suppression where um, you're being silenced or um, you're being almost manipulated, and this is the the other danger, you're being manipulated and almost um, led with the, the breadcrumbs down a certain way to think, to act, to feel a certain way, that is a type of suppression of your identity, of who you are as a Mm -hmm. human being, that takes away that rightful expression of being able to be honest and transparent with what you're feeling and what you're doing. And so here's the, the other question, well, why do I deserve a voice? Like theologically, I don't know if there's anybody thinking like, you know, why you do I even on, deserve? You can count on that because I've heard that myriad of times. Uh, do I even get to speak? Should I? Do I have the right? And yeah. I, and my answer is really simple because you're a daughter of the king. Come on. Because you're a son of the king. Because you're made in the likeness and the image of the king. Now, here's the interesting thing about being royalty. Being royalty gives you incredible privilege, incredible honor. And there's also simultaneous massive responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so we have the opportunity and we're being welcomed into a conversation. And the action of denying that and stripping that away from you is an an offense. This is just me talking at this point. It is offense against the royal image that you bear. 